Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Hill, Texas history teacher for Team Michigan State here at Owsley Junior High School. And today we are going to learn about the Texas frontier. Um, if uh, you're a virtual learner, you're going to be doing your notes in uh, Google Slide, a Google Doc version of the uh, notes. Um, if you are um, a face-to-face -face student, you're more than likely going to be doing this on paper, or you may be uh, choosing to do it on the Google Doc as well. Just make sure that you are filling out your notes as we go because there will be a quiz that follows. So the first thing, we're talking about the Texas frontier. And I know that in, in, in my class, we talked about this. Uh, I can't help but feel that in the other classes you guys did too. The, the question that usually comes to mind for the students is, well, what is, what is the frontier? So we do have a key term. We're going to talk about what a, a, the frontier is here in just a moment, but let's look at our key terms first. Um, <clears throat> our first key term is the era of cattle, cotton, and railroads. That's the era that we're studying now with this unit. It is the period of huge economic growth in Texas. Now remember, economic has to do with what? That's right, money. So it was a period of huge growth in Texas where people were earning a lot of money. The three largest industries were cattle ranching, cotton farming, just the way that it had been for years, and also railroads. Railroads were being built and uh, were becoming a big industry in Texas. So cattle, uh, cotton, and railroads. Okay, so now to answer that question, what is the frontier? Well, the frontier is basically an undeveloped region just beyond or at the edge of a settled area. So imagine, um, if you would, back in the 1800s in Texas, uh, there were all these towns and settlements, and when new people would move in, they would have to move beyond those settlements and those towns. Uh, they would have to move past that edge, that kind of imaginary line where um, on one side of the line was the quote unquote civilized world, the the towns and the cities and the uh, people doing business and growing crops and cattle and stuff like that. And on the other side, it was just pure uh, empty prairie uh, that was inhabited only by wild animals and Native Americans. So that, that frontier is actually just the edge that divides the civilized from the quote unquote uncivilized. Our next key term is windmill. And we've all heard this word before. We have a pretty good idea what it means. A windmill is a machine that runs by power generated by the wind to pump water from underground. So as the, um, as the wind blows the turbine and it spins, it causes the mechanism attached to the windmill itself to move up and down and pump water from a pipe deep, deep underground. Uh, and it allowed you, it allowed farmers and ranchers then to not have to rely so much on rainfall and on existing groundwater like rivers and, and lakes and creeks to provide water for their animals and their crops. We have one mini biography today and truth be told we only have one uh, mini biography in this whole unit and that person is Quana Parker. And yes, that is a man. Um, he was a Native American, so he had long hair. Uh, Quana Parker was the son of a white woman and a Comanche chief. Quana Parker's mother had been taken captive when she was a very young girl and had been raised by the Comanches. And when she reached a certain age, uh, she uh, married uh, one of the chiefs of the Comanche tribe, the, the band that she was with. And they had a son, and they named him Quana. He was the last war chief of the Comanche, uh, meaning he was the last Comanche chief to actually lead the Comanche people in um, battle against uh, uh, white settlers in the, in the U.S. Army. He was the one who convinced his people, the Comanches, that they could not win against the U.S. Army and that they should surrender, and they did so. So, but we'll talk more about him a little further in the, uh, in the presentation. So our essential question today, how did settlers need for land 
affect Texas Native Americans? So how did the need for land by the white settlers, how did that affect the Native American population in Texas, the people who lived on that land that the settlers wanted? All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the expansion of the frontier and how as more and more people moved in, the edge of that frontier moved further and further west. So number one, the major cause for the expansion of the frontier was the desire for farming and ranching land. Um, as the population of Texas grew, Texans wanted to expand into land occupied by Native Americans, by Indians. So here's a map of, of Texas in the, in the 1860s. Uh, <clears throat> you can see uh, this set of red dots. Uh, actually, uh, those were locations of, of U.S. Army forts. Uh, you can't really look at the legend on this because this was... Uh, uh, this was a, a map that was made for the Civil War, but it gives you a really good idea of where the frontier forts were located. So this line of connected red dots at one time was the frontier in the 1860s. And as more and more people moved into Texas and were demanding more and more land, they began to expand westward. Unfortunately, that land was occupied by the Kiowa, the Comanche, and the Apache. So something was going to have to give because you had this influx of Anglo settlers who were moving in. So one of the ways that the uh, U.S. Army decided to um, try to deal with the Indians was by killing the buffalo herds. Now, the way I uh, uh, try to express this to my students is, uh, some years ago, I moved into a new house, and it was sort of out in the country. And uh, we had a lot of uh, a lot of spiders. We had a problem with spiders. Uh, some of them were little tiny spiders. Some of them were these big, giant wolf spiders that were like as big around as a softball uh, when their legs were all spread out. And uh, it just freaked everybody out. So I called an exterminator who was a friend of mine, and I asked him to come out. and And I said, "Look, I don't. All I know is I want you to spray for the spiders and kill them." And he said, "Well." He said, you can't really spray for spiders. He said, if you want to get rid of spiders, what you do is you get rid of all the insects that they and the bugs that they eat. So what he did is he sprayed and killed all the little, you know, little beetles and ants and grasshoppers and crickets and everything. And sure enough, without food there, the spiders had to go somewhere where there was food and they, they took off. They wandered off and we didn't see them again for several years until we found the need to uh, call our exterminator and have them come back out. So the U.S. Army almost drove the buffalo to extinction in order to eliminate the Native American food supply. The, remember the Native Americans of the plains, we learned this back at the first of the year, the Native American tribes on the plains relied almost entirely on the buffalo for their source of food, for everything, uh, for their clothing even, because they would use the hide of the buffalo, the skin of the buffalo to make their clothes. So without the buffalo, uh, the Native Americans really suffered. Over 30 million buffalo were killed and Indians began to starve. And here is a picture uh, at a camp where the buffalo hides were brought after they were killed out on the prairie. Uh, huge crews of men would go out and they would shoot the buffalo. And, uh, and then as they shot the buffalo, a crew and would, uh, with wagons would pull up behind them uh, and they would just, uh, they would skin the buffalo right there on the prairie. Uh, they would take the horns. Oftentimes they would take the tongues. Um, Buffalo hide was used for a lot of things, not only for clothing and coats and leather, uh, but was also used to make um, uh, the belts that went into old steam machines that were in factories that ran the works and the operation. So because of the disappearance of the buffalo, the Indians were forced, or they began to be forced to move to reservations. Now, a reservation is government land that is set aside uh, for, the, for the Native Americans that were relocated from where they lived to this new place. 
and faced with starvation, Indians from Texas had to move to reservations in Oklahoma to survive. And unfortunately, when they did that, um, they sort of lost their identity as Native Americans who were self-sufficient and roamed the plains and, and had these big villages. And now they became dependent on uh, the food, um, the clothing, the housing, everything that was supplied by the U.S. government. And they sort of lost that cultural identity. So here's a map of present day Oklahoma, and you can see how Oklahoma was divided up and the land was given to different tribes. Uh, and if you're familiar at all, if you ever hear the commercials or whatever, um, there are, um, uh, there's Choctaw Casino in Oklahoma. If you people in Texas oftentimes will drive across the border into Oklahoma to go to one of the casinos. Um, you can see the Chickasaw, uh, the Kiowas, the Comanches, the Apaches, uh, the Cherokees, which we've talked about the Cherokees before. Now, one of the things that's interesting is a lot of these Indian tribes here, like the Seminoles, they were re relocated to Oklahoma from Florida. Uh, the Sac and Fox and the uh, Potawatomi, uh, the Shawnee, Kickapoo, Iowa, the Iowa, where do you think they came from? I tried, they came from Iowa and they were forced to leave their land and, and move to, uh, uh, move to Oklahoma, much like the, uh, the Delaware people who were from, that's right, the Delaware area. So with the, uh, introduction of windmills that it really helped the expansion of the frontiers now you may ask well how does a windmill help with the expansion of the frontier well ranchers no longer relied on rain and above ground water sources to provide water for their cattle uh, if you've ever been out to west texas you know it's 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 dry area you know you just drive for miles and miles and just see flat prairie um, and there's not a whole lot of above ground water well it wasn't good for raising cattle, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't a place that, that the cattle could survive. Well, with the invention of the windmill and the idea that you can bring water from deep underground to fill up tanks and cisterns to feed or to water your animals, it allowed these ranchers to move into areas that they never thought they could, um, could raise cattle. So quick question, is the use of a windmill on a farm or ranch an example of adapting to the environment or modifying the environment. Now, for those of you who don't know what they mean, adapt means you change to fit your environment. Modify means you change the environment to fit you. So which best describes the use of the windmill? Think about it for a second. Well, if you said that building and using a windmill is modifying the environment you're correct because this was ranchers and farmers going out and instead of getting you know having to only plant crops that could grow with limited water they changed their environment they brought water to the surface where it hadn't been there before and they were able to water their plants their crops uh, water their animals so yes they modified their environment to fit their needs Another reason for the expansion of the frontier was the growth of railroads. Railroads made it easier for people and goods to move into the frontier. It also provided a way for the farmers who lived out in this new frontier uh, with the new lands that they were using for farming and ranching. It gave them a way to ship their product, their harvested crops, their, their animals. It gave them a way to ship them to other places where the need was high for those things. Now, <clears throat> here's how the railroad worked in expanding the frontier. Let's say that you have point A and point B and that they're, you know, several hundred miles apart. So the railroad comes in and builds tracks between point A and point B. Well, the thing is railroad engines back then were powered by steam. Now to make steam, you need water. So the train engines had to fill up with water from time to time. And along the train route, there were water towers that were built. And as the train moved from point A to point B, it would have to stop occasionally at those water towers and fill the tank up with water. 
And as they did, people would be stuck in these little areas for some time, you know, maybe, you know, a couple hours while they let the train cool, while they filled the engine with water and while they prepared to move on. So because of that, wherever the train stopped to, to reload that tank with water, you would have little towns that would crop up and people would move to those towns because they knew that the train was coming through and that people would be getting off the train uh, and that they would need goods and services. So <clears throat> with the expansion of the frontier, what this did is it brought Anglo settlers into even more conflict with Native Americans. Uh, you had all of these people coming in wanting land and they wanted the land that the Indians believed was theirs. So obviously that's going to cause a conflict. Comanches, Kiowas, and Apaches fought against the westward expansion of Texas. They raided towns, they raided farms and ranches, uh, they stole horses, they killed people, uh, they took captives. Um, it, was, it was not pretty. Uh, it was very violent, very bloody, and it was a dangerous place to live. So the U.S. government knowing that the Indians were, were wreaking all this havoc on settlers, the U.S. government came up with a plan. They were going to make peace with the, the Plains Indians. Uh, and what they were going to do is they were going to sign a treaty. A treaty is a contract that sort of usually it's used to kind of end hostilities. So the U.S. government uh, decided that they were going to come up with this treaty. They met at a place called Medicine Lodge and therefore it became known as the Medicine Lodge Treaty. So the U.S. government offered the Plains Indians, the Comanches, the Kiowas, the Apache, and others medicine, food, and supplies if they would move to reservations and stop raiding white settlements. Now, unfortunately, both sides believed that the other side failed, up to, or failed to live up to the treaty and, and violence as with most of the treaties signed between uh, the U.S. government and Native Americans, uh, somebody would falter, somebody would make a mistake, Indians would raid, uh, white people would be killed, the U.S. Army would come in and wipe out Indians, and it just, it just was a vicious cycle. It just repeated itself over and over and over. And, of course, the treaty failed in this case. So... <clears throat> In response to um, the Native American issues, uh, forts were built on the frontier. And a lot of times, towns would grow up wherever these forts were built. Uh, for instance, Fort Worth, Texas started out as a place called Fort Worth. It was a, a fort called Worth. Um, and you have all these places where you see the little black square, the black uh, dots. That is where uh, frontier forts were built. So the army set up these forts, but the problem is they were ineffective because they were too far apart. In fact, they were so far apart that sometimes the forts themselves were put in danger because of the sheer number of Native Americans that would, uh, would get together for a war or a raiding party. So as part of the people who served in these forts, you had the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, Buffalo Soldiers were African-American cavalry soldiers who protected the frontier and tracked natives, particularly in Texas and up through the Great Plains. Now, there was a, um, after the Civil War, you had a bunch of young African-Americans who had been freed and they didn't have jobs. And one of the actual good opportunities for them was to join the United States Army. And when they joined the Army, they were given a place to live. They were given a job. Uh, they were paid for their work. They were given nice uniforms. They were given guns and, and rode horses. And they got to do things that, that they probably never would have imagined that they could do when they were slaves. So becoming a Buffalo soldier became sort of a, a thing of honor, a cavalry soldier. Now, the reason that they were called Buffalo soldiers uh, 
was because the Indians gave them that name. Uh, they gave them their name, that name because of their dark skin, because buffaloes are a dark brown, and because of their great fighting ability, because they, the Indians always said that like the buffalo, when a buffalo was cornered uh, or was in a dangerous situation or was wounded, it was at its most dangerous. And they found that the fighting abilities of these buffalo soldiers was was unlike anything they had seen before. So uh, the Buffalo Soldiers were were um, were a huge part of of American lore and and definitely of African American uh, lore. You know, I mean, uh, there are still people today who study the Buffalo Soldiers and who do reenactments and and who have these big grand celebrations and stuff of the Buffalo Soldiers and their their uh, their history. So that's really a really a neat part of our history. So that brings us back to Quanah Parker. As I said, uh, Quanah Parker was the son of white captive Cynthia Ann Parker and a man named Peter Nakona, who was a Comanche war chief. His father was killed and his mother was taken by the white men when Quanah was just a boy. Um, she was taken back to, uh, back to quote unquote, once again, I keep saying that civilization um, <clears throat> and she was forced to live like a white person, and, and she did not want to do that. Uh, she wanted to stay with her Comanche family. She wanted to be with her children. She actually had two sons and a daughter. Um, <clears throat> the, the little girl was, was taken and captured with Cynthia Ann and returned to her family um, in, uh, I believe, in Weatherford or, or uh, somewhere around the Fort Worth area, actually. And... Um, uh, the little girl's name was Top Santa, which means prairie flower. And her and Cynthia lived there with her family for a number of years. And the little girl got sick and she died. And not long after that, Cynthia Ann just gave up because she couldn't see her sons. Her husband was dead and now her daughter was dead. And, and Cynthia Ann just stopped eating, became very sick. And, and she eventually died too, all because they would not let her return to the lifestyle that she wanted to live, which is a you know, very sad story. So Quana, however, would eventually become the last Comanche chief. Um, and, and he's the one who convinced the Comanche people to surrender to the U.S. Army and move to the reservations in Oklahoma. Now, that's not where the story ended for Quana, though, because Quana was somewhat of a celebrity uh, because he was half white and half Comanche. Um, you know, he became sort of famous. Um, he, he learned to speak English. Um, he inherited money and land from his from his white mother's family. And Quana went on to become a successful cattle rancher in Texas and in Oklahoma. And, and like I said, somewhat of a celebrity, he, he would go and make personal appearances. He rode in parades in New York City and in Washington, D.C. He became, became friends with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who was president of the United States. Um, he performed in uh, uh, his full Comanche war regalia with his feathered headdress and his cloak and red uh, painted face. Um, in the uh, Buffalo Bills Wild West show that toured the country. So um, he ended up being, being a pretty famous guy. So by 1875, the Comanche had surrendered and had moved to a reservation in Oklahoma. What they had been, where they had lived, was all gone. It was in the past. So with the threat of the Comanche gone, settlers began to flood into the frontier. Um, as, as, like I said, as the Comanche and the Kiowa moved out of this area, uh, more and more American settlers moved in and just filled this area with farms and ranches. So our summary, faced with starvation or death, Texas Indians moved to reservations in Oklahoma. Well, that's about it for the Texas frontier. I hope you guys learned something. Um, uh, lots of interesting history here. Uh, I would particularly encourage you to, uh, uh, to look up uh, stories of the Buffalo Soldiers and of Quanah Parker because uh, those are two really kind of larger than life stories here in Texas that have, uh, have survived, you know, 
over a hundred years after they sort of uh, sort of disappeared. So until next time, uh, I will talk to you guys later.